and uh, turn to the Gospel of John. John chapter 5. The Gospel of John chapter 5, and we're going to read the first 18 verses together. John chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. When you get there, just give me a smile or a nod. Just be all the way there. John chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. I want to tell you all uh, a truth. I love reading about Jesus. I don't know how many of you all enjoy it, but I really do. Uh, it says an average Christian uh, spends about 10 to 15 minutes on the Bible every week. Uh, that's not enough, is it? Man, that's not enough. Um, I love reading about Jesus. And today we're blessed because we get to read about him. And uh, we're, we're a very interesting miracle that takes place in the life and times when Jesus walked among us. Uh, John chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. And this is what took place. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Arise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, and he, he took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured, Is it not the Sabbath? Is, not the law for you, is it against the law for you to carry the bed, is it? They answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But he was the one who... Uh, the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn and a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. See and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told Jesus that it was Jesus, excuse me, told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and this moment. We can look into your word, and we can read about you. And God, may this word tell us about you and also reflect to us who we are in you, who we are because of you, and who we can be. And Father, I pray that you'd move me aside, let the very spirit of Jesus minister and move among all of us. God, that no one can claim that they did not meet with God today or experience Jesus. And Father, if there is someone here today who has not received the greatest healing, Lord, let them receive you in their heart to this day. And Lord, we pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. And for this reason, Jesus made himself equal to that of God, and the, the Jews had a great problem with that. And if you looked at all the philosophies and all the religions of the world, Jesus is the only one who admitted himself to being equal or God himself. Jesus is the only one, but he's the only one who could back it up. And he backed it up with love, he backed it up with sacrifice, and he backed it up with wonders and miracles. Now, some of you can uh, kind of write off some of this because no one was there when it happened. But listen, we sit here because somebody saw it. We sit here because somebody experienced it. And I don't know about you, but I would not be willing to die for a lie. 
And if you looked at the words that Jesus said, all those red letters, right? All the, the, you know, the truth is in what? The red letters, right? We, we look at these red letters, the words that Jesus spoke. If you look at these words, if Jesus said that he was God, and he wasn't, that makes him either a liar or a lunatic, as some theologians uh, debate. Now, if Jesus was a lunatic, have you read his word? Have you se- uh, seen what he has said? A, luna- a lunatic could not say these things. Now, Jesus couldn't have been a liar because liars would not die for no reason. They would find out a great lie to tell so they would not, what, die. The only thing that we can come up with is possibly, what if Jesus was telling the truth here? You know, it says in Romans 5, 6 through 8, it says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, whom I am one. Amen. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still what? Sinners, Christ died for us. Reach over to that person beside you and say, Jesus loves you. Reach over to the other person saying, sometimes I like you. (laughs) Amen. Sometimes I like you. You know, I believe that Jesus loved the unlovable. But he didn't like the Pharisees, did he? He didn't like what they believed or what they did. And in this case, we see the beauty of Jesus' love played out in an awesome miracle. I love this miracle right here. But Jesus wasn't just telling the truth. You see, Jesus, he was the truth. And all those who find that truth find life. And all those who cast that truth aside abandon life and embrace death. You see, Jesus was bringing in himself a relationship because he said that I and the Father are one so that you may be one with me and the Father. You see, Jesus wanted to bring you into this big family. I love what Brother Al said, we, we finally found a family. And that is what a church is. That is what the kingdom of God is. It is a family. And Jesus was willing to not only die for his family, but for those who even curse his family and his name. That is the supreme nature of his love. But we see in this moment, all these people are gathered together at this sheep gate. And they're gathered because they're all seeking healing or restoration. People gather all the time. People will gather to celebrate. People will gather for football games, amen? We'll gather. We'll gather when food is there. We'll gather. You know, whenever a baby's in the congregation, I know if a new baby's there because all the ladies have gathered around the baby. I know exactly when that happens because they gather. We gather for something spectacular. We gather to see something. You might have seen on the news people in Florida and in and, and Texas, they've been gathering but for resources. They've been gathering because they, they need, they have, they're in desperation. But we, together, gather. What if we would gather not to receive, but to give worship to God? I mean, we should do that every Sunday, right? When we gather together in this way. Uh, a pastor, had a, a young man come to him, he's like, Pastor, I want more of God. And the pastor said, well, we have uh, Wednesday night Bible studies that you could get it plugged in one of those. He goes, no, Pastor, I don't want to read the Bible and go to Bible study. I want more of God. And he said, well, well, son, you know, we have this discipleship program. Maybe you can disciple one of our younger men here. No, no I don't want to disciple. I want more of God. And he said, well, well, son, have you looked at our program where we go into the inner city and we feed the homeless? And he said, no, I, I don't want to do anything. I just want more of God. Do you understand, pastor? And the pastor looked at him. He's like, no, I, I don't understand. Because if you really want more of God, you'll mo- want more of his word. And if you really want more of God, then you will love the things that God loves and you will hate the things that God hates. You know what? God loves you. Everyone around you. You know what God hates? He hates sin. Sin destroys families. It destroys hearts and minds. Sin is the cancer of the world. And Jesus wants to obliterate it from your life. Do you want more of God? I don't believe you. Do you want more of God? Amen? Because we should thirst after Him. 
Because we're here gathered together to experience God together. We're here gathered to worship Him and that He would commune with us that we might be different after this experience. Because wherever Jesus went, people were changed. And that's what I want to be about. He went to this pool, this great place of suffering. And wherever there is great suffering, there is great cause that Jesus could be among these people. But you see, Jesus said that He was the light of the world, but soon the light will be taken from the world because we are His light now. You. Do you always feel like light? Do you always feel like a bright sunshine? Amen. Especially in the mornings. How many of y'all just need that coffee? Amen. How many of you husbands were like, yeah, I make that coffee for her real quick, right? Because sometimes we need a little bit more. But listen, if you have Christ, you have this light inside of you, this joy inside of you, because you have been saved not from yesterday or today. You've been saved for eternity. And we're trying to secure our future. Uh, many want the benefits of God, but they don't want to be committed to Him. Many want the safety and the umbrella of religion, but they don't want to step out and take the risk of faith. Aren't you glad that Jesus risked it all for you? When we look at this passage here, let's look at verses 1-5. through five. It says this, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda. Now, say Bethesda. Very good. Y'all did very good. This can be translated in Hebrew, House of Mercy or House of Outpouring. Which is very ironic, because it was right by the Sheep Gate... And listen, it's, it's very simple why it's called the Sheep Gate, because many people who would come to worship God and sacrifice, do you know what they would mostly bring through that gate? Sheep. So here we have all these people. There's probably a lot of uh, sheep sounds. People are going into worship. And as they're going to worship and sacrifice to the Lord and give Him a great sacrifice, they're passing by what? Bethesda. This big, big pool. There's five uh, porches there of water. And all these people who are there, what are they? They're suffering. They're sick. They're blind. They're lame. They're hurting. And they're at the outside walls of the temple, not even inside. And as people are going to worship, they're passing by what? Everyone who's suffering. It's just kind of ironic. And it's called house of mercy or house of outpouring. But all we see is these people begging just to be healed. And it's so, so very ironic and it says in verse 3, And in these lay great multitudes of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for what? The moving of the waters. Because as John writes here, For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water, and then whosoever what? Stepped in what? First. They would get what? All right, so I need you to put yourself by this pool. I need you to understand there's multitudes around. Everybody is in the same boat. You're either sick, lame, blind, hurt. You've you got something going on. Everybody's in the same boat. And you're all waiting on what? For the waters to do what? To stir. Now I'm going to tell you what. What if a, a swift gust of wind just blew down? What's going to happen? Those waters are going to move. And you know what the people are going to do? Jump in! Have you ever seen a bunch of kids when you first get to the pool and there's a big group of kids? Every kid wants to be what? That first one to do a big cannonball. Amen. You see them all running towards it. And, and, and I don't know how many of y'all have ever been shopping on a Black Friday. Right? How many of y'all have been there? How many of y'all actually braid the jungles? You take a big group. You crazy people. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's not my scene. That's just not what I would do. But I, I saw on like the news, you can look it up. It was like several years ago. Uh, there's a crowd in Walmart. And at, uh, during a certain time, they said the first 50 people there to the electronics are going to get like a 40% discount on widescreen TVs. And so in the madness of that, because there's over hundreds of people in this one store, some lady ends up getting kicked in the face for a widescreen TV. But it's 45% off. You know what we get excited about sometimes is not really worth getting excited about? 
All these people here, they were waiting for something. They were waiting on restoration. They were waiting on healing. They were waiting on this angel to touch his finger to this water, and it ripples, and whoever got in there first to receive the healing. How backwards. And then we learn about this guy who'd been there for 38 years, a paralytic. How many people got pushed out of the way when the waters just rippled a little bit? How violent the crowd might have gotten just to be that first one in the water so they can be what? Healed. Well, forget the rest of you. It's about me right now. It's my turn. I should be it. Because I don't think they, they drew straws, people. I think whenever that water rippled, they would jump in expecting a healing. You know, we look at this, and I want to ask you a question, because there, there is great suffering. There's suffering everywhere. Many people will use the fact that their suffering is the reason why there is no God. But I, I will tell you this, because suffering isn't God's fault. Suffering is kind of our fault. Suffering is here because sin is here. You see, God loved us enough to become a victim of the very suffering that we caused. That's how much God loved us. Because if anybody knows about suffering, our Christ Jesus knows about suffering. Because he was born in our likeness, born with our same problems, yet he remained what? Sinless. Do you know how challenging that must have been for Jesus? Even though he was the son of God, he was among all these sinful people all 24-7, all the time. And this also tells us that when Jesus remained sinful, it wasn't just what he did. It also means that every battle that he ever fought in the mind, he won. Jesus won every battle that I would ever lose. Because he loves us. Jesus knows about suffering. So I will ask you this question. Are you letting your suffering define who you are? Or will you allow your Savior to define who you are? Because you can let suffering define who you are, and that suffering will twist you and turn you into something that you would never want to be. But listen, Jesus sees who you can be, and he wants to create in you a new creation. So whatever kind of suffering that you go through, you understand that God goes through it with you, that you're not alone. Like all of these people at this pool, they were in it for themselves, just waiting on the water to ripple so that they could experience healing. But church, you are not in this alone. He's given us His Word, His Spirit, and each other. So Jesus, He shows up on the scene. How many of you like it when Jesus shows up? Amen. Jesus shows up among all this suffering. Look at verse 6. When Jesus saw Him lying there and knew He had already been there in that condition a long time, He said to Him, Do you want to be made well? Now, this sounds like a no-brainer question. Like, I could walk up to one of you, and it's like, hey, would you like the, all your financial debt to be gone? How many of you are like, no, pastor, I'd rather work on it myself. I mean, who would, who would turn that down, right? You know, all my financial debt just gone? Well, sure, but can I actually go shopping first? <laughs> would not some of us do that, right? What? Jesus asked this man who had been suffering how long? 38 years. That's two years short of how long the Israelites were in the desert wandering around. That's most people, man, 38 years, that's a long time to suffer anything. But here he is paralyzed on a mat outside of this pool. So this question, I don't think Jesus is asking him a question that he knew the answer to. Jesus, whenever he asked a question, he was getting that person to think about a response. You see, I believe that Jesus was challenging this man's resolve to be healed. Because for 38 years, where, where has he been at? Presumably at this pool. To receive what? A healing. Even though he was paralyzed and could not get himself over there. And listen to his response to Jesus. He says, sir, I have no man to what? Put me in the pool. When the water is stirred up. But while I am coming... Who's taking him? Himself. How is he getting there? He's crawling. Another step down before me. This man would crawl. He would crawl every time to this pool in hopes of what? Restoration. Freedom. He wanted the walk. 
He wanted to receive the healing that everybody has talked about. And he was willing to crawl. You see, Jesus is asking about his resolve, really. Don't you want to be healed? Well, yes, but Jesus, how can I be? And you know what Jesus does? He does the most amazing things. He asked him to do the impossible. He looked at this man and he said, arise. You know what? God wants you not to crawl. God wants you to be walking in Him, running in Him, flying in Him. But God never wants you to crawl. Because listen, this world will make you crawl. Sin will make you crawl. But Jesus is that hope that we have that we can rise. Jesus says to you, rise. Take up your mat and walk. And you know what He did? He did the impossible. Listen, when God tells you to do the impossible, if you believe Him and have faith in Him, listen, He might do impossible things through His church. He might do impossible things through His people. And He got up and He took His mat and He walked. Amen? And I don't know about you, but I'm assuming that He left that uh, spot immediately. He probably just took off. And we see in these next few verses, look at verse 10. Then the judgment came. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. And it technically wasn't. They made all these rules on top of God's word that they, they couldn't do all these different things. Like he couldn't carry his mat because that would be considered labor. But you know what? You could carry somebody who was in a mat, but you couldn't carry your mat. How very interesting. And he answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up my bed and walk. And then they asked him, Who is the man who said, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did what? He didn't know who it was. So, and this is so hilarious to me a little bit because it's like Jesus just healed this guy. He said, Arise, take up your mat and walk. He's like, Thanks, buddy. You know, but it, it, we learn in the text it was so crowded and the multitudes were there, Jesus kind of slipped away. But this guy didn't even know who healed him. And you know what is very alarming and very truthful? How many times has God saved us, delivered us, healed us, ransomed us, and we have no idea that it was him? And we don't give him glory, we don't give him thanks. I was watching a news report one time on the TV where this guy was a victim of road rage, where he was just walking down the street on a sidewalk, and a car was mad at another car and just started squealing his tires to ram into him. Well, the car moved, and the car jumped the curb where the guy was walking. And the car literally ran over him. There was video where the car ran right over this guy. He had like a, a tire track up against his shirt. And, the, and, and there was nothing wrong with him, though, guys. It was like when the car hit the curb, it just went right over him. And so he's talking to the, the person on the, uh, the uh, news, and he had the microphone. He's like, sir, this is amazing. How do you feel that you were saved? What about that curb just saving you like that? He goes, curb? That was the Lord. And the news person's eyes got big. He's like, all right, back to you. <laughs> we'll give glory to a curb or give glory to God. Amen. Amen, sister. I'll tell you what. A celebrity who had cancer and he beat it. They were asking him about his journey beating cancer. And he said, I didn't do it through prayer or faith or God. I beat cancer. Uh, some refugees were getting help from some missionaries. And they were driving a helicopter in with all this foods and products and stuff. And as they were uh, coming down and they landed, the helicopter began to uh, fly away. And at that point, they see a tornado or a cyclone over there coming towards them. It was huge. It was just barreling down towards them. And the missionaries began to pray. And right when the tornado got to the clearing, it stopped and went all the way around them and then continued on. It's pretty awesome, right? So the missionaries were like, man, thank you, Jesus. And then some of the, the uh, locals came running up to them. It's like, did you see? Did you see? Even the gods have come to celebrate what you've brought to us. Who is your healer? Do you know who your healer is? Do you know who to thank? Because when someone is healed, three things must take place. 
One thing is always faith. But it has to be the faith of the one who's sick, the faith of those who are praying, the intercessors, and the, the faith of the healer. And, and what we wish for is healing. But listen, Jesus, he didn't tell him who he was. He just kind of walked off. But what we see in these verses, though, after this guy gets reprimanded, it says in verse 14, what does it say right there in verse 14? Afterward, Jesus, a beautiful name, found him in the temple and said to him, See, you've been made well. Sin no more, least what? A worse thing befall you. That's ominous. You see, Jesus healed him physically, but that does not make his soul right. You see, God can heal you in three different ways. He can heal your, your physical being, your mental being, and your spiritual being. Body, mind, and what? Soul. Amen. God wants to heal you, but, but listen, let's be real. We majorly focus on the body and the mind. That's really all we focus on. That's all we pay attention to. It's like, man, I've got to go to the gym. I've got to run a lot so I can be physically fit. I, I've got to have a sharp mind. But sometimes what we fail to notice and take responsibility of is our spiritual well-being. And listen, you alone cannot feed your spiritual being without God because God is your resource. God is your water. God is your food for your soul. How many of you have ever went to the refrigerator and opened it? But well, you didn't know what you wanted, so you shot it. You walked in the room. You, you come back in there. You open it again. How many of you have ever done that? It's like, well, I'm not really hungry, but I just want to open this to feel the draft. Have you ever just on a hot summer day opened that refrigerator and just stood there and just experienced the, just the cool air? The owner of Bilo told me to leave after that. And uh, <laughs> so, but have you ever went there? I, I am very certain that when we want something but we don't know what we want physically, we really need to pray. Because we really are searching. You see, your body and soul are intertwined. Whenever you're spiritually down, you'll feel physically down. Because we're all one. We're the most unique creature on the planet. We're shaped and fashioned to be in His image. But you see, Jesus told him to what? Really, he told him to what? Repent. Amen. He said, sin no more. I want to read you out of Acts chapter 3. Uh, Peter and John came across a paralytic and healed him. And they said this in Acts 3 verse 19. It says, repent therefore and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. How many of you want times of refreshing? Do you want to be refreshed and renewed by God? Do you want to have a fresh experience with God every day? Then we must remain in his will. You must walk with him. He wants to walk with you. Do you want more of God? Because listen, God wants more of you. God desires you to be where He is. But you've got to ask yourself, do I desire God? You see, these Jews, when they looked upon this, the Pharisees and Sadducees, it says, look at verse 16. It says, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill Him because He had done these things on what? The Sabbath. How dare you heal a man who'd been sick 38 years and couldn't walk? How dare you heal him on the Lord's day? You see, their law had become uh, the opposite of God's presence and will for mankind. Jesus answered, My Father has been working until now. And I've been working. You know what? The Sabbath is not about inactivity. The Sabbath is about active worship. That's what the Sabbath is about. Are you actively worshiping? Listen, because earlier we learned that you can't carry your mat, but you can carry somebody who's in a mat. How many of those Pharisees walked by this guy who was sitting on that mat, desperately wanting to get where? To that pool. To experience what? Healing. 
You see, these religious people, they were just religious. And people can hide in their re religious nature, but listen, faith demands something much more. Faith demands risk. Faith demands sacrifice at times. Because you will see somebody who is in desperation and you must sacrifice your time sometimes to help them. Sometimes you have to sacrifice your comfort. But we'll end with this. It says in Jeremiah 2.13 that my people have committed two great sins. One, they have forsaken the Lord God. He is the life support. And two, they have went to cesterns that are cracked and that cannot hold water. If we're very honest with ourselves, if we're not careful, we'll return to cracked cesterns that will never fill you, that will never leave you satisfied or sustained, that will always leave you wanting more. But God wishes to pour himself into you. God wishes for you to be a vessel and that he pours into you so you can pour out onto others. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will what? Never be thirsty. About a, over a year and a half ago, my youngest daughter, Allie, she uh, decided that it was time for her to make her own chocolate milk. And I, I kind of, you know what, I miss them being babies sometimes because they can't meow, 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 you know? I kind of miss that. They can't talk back when they're babies. But what I do like is their autonomy because they learn to do things on their own. It's really great. And so she said, Dad, I want to make chocolate milk on my own. It's like, all right, make me one too. Right? And so I'm sitting there, I'm watching her. She, she gets a cup. She takes that chocolate syrup and she just starts to go. And you know, I'm sitting, you know, she's like four or five at the time. I'm sitting there thinking, will she know when to stop? I know she doesn't, but I want to see how far she'll go. Right? This is her first time. This is a valuable lesson. So she's sitting there. She's pouring all the chocolate in there. And, and, and long ago, I should have said, whoa, stop. And you've seen kids grab syrup on pancakes, and they're like, yeah. I still do that. Yeah. All right? We still do that because we want a lot of it because it's sweet and beautiful. And she's just uh, putting it all in there. And, and she's like, I was like, baby, you're not going to leave any chocolate for me. You'll be fine. <laughs> we as adults, we would have stopped her long ago because we don't want a four-year-old to have sugar BTs, right? Amen. We would have stopped her long before that and said, no, that's too much. I want to tell you this. Jesus will never tell you you've had enough of him. God will never say, nope, you've had too much prayer. You've had too much reading that Bible. There's been too... No, you can never have enough of Jesus. So really, the question is, are you hungry for him? Do you want more of God? Would you stand as we go to him in prayer? Heavenly Father, as we open up this invitation... As this man for 38 years crawled to get restoration, all he had to do was sit and wait on you. And you healed him. So that he'd never have to crawl again. And Father, there are some of us, we're just crawling around, and we don't know what we're doing. But God, we need your touch, and we need your restoration. Be with us now, Father. Let us... Rend our hearts, not our ears. Let us listen and be obedient to your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.